you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So again, in quick summary, there are promises in the Bible by the thousands. They all fall within two categories, conditional promises and unconditional promises. Divine healing is a conditional promise. There are things that you have to cooperate with in order for the supernatural power of divine healing to be activated in your life. And that is why, and we're going to cover it in greater detail. Now, I'm going to be uh, incredibly gracious. I, I really am disgusted when I hear people teach on divine healing and people that are battling with real infirmity, real sickness, real pain, they condemn them. Uh, they say, well, there must be some sin in your life. And, and I'll not go down all of the negativity of false teachers on divine healing. But that's not what Jesus taught us. You have to, and this is vitally important, you have to remember that you cannot take one verse of Scripture and build a doctrine upon that if you have not also studied the entirety of that subject in the context of the Bible. And let me give you another example. I like to give examples to people because I think it helps them to better understand the definitions of what I'm teaching. There is a passage in the Bible where the Scripture said, Go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon thee. And based upon that one verse, some have taught concerning divine healing that if you're praying and you're not healed, there must be some sin in your life unconfessed. There must be something wrong with you that has not been brought into the light of God's forgiveness and you are not living in repentance. And they can be very condemning with that. Well, let's just be biblical here. Some sicknesses are directly related to unrepentant sin. That's in the Bible. Go in sin, lest, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. So continued living in sin opens the door of worse things and sickness coming upon you. That's in the Bible. But that's not the only reason why people are sick. Because in another passage of Scripture, the disciples asked Jesus, Who did sin? that this boy is facing this physical ailment. And Jesus said, Neither his father nor his mother, but that the works of God might be glorified in him. So here's another passage in the Bible and an example that shows us that this particular case had nothing to do with this boy sinning or his parents sinning or what some would refer to as generational curses, which, by the way, are not biblical. And... Uh, Amy, make a note of that. I'll teach on that uh, in upcoming days. Generational curses are not biblical. And you need to understand that because if you're involved in a teaching that supports generational curses, then you're always going to have this open door of it's not my fault, it's my grandfather's fault, or it's my great-great-grandmother's fault. And generational curses are undone through the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man, that word man in the original generic means male or female, if any person comes to Christ, old things pass away and all things become new. In the new covenant of Jesus Christ, when we are saved, we are saved from all. And there is nothing in your past or in your family's past or in your generations past that wades through the blood of Jesus Christ and His forgiveness and continues to have authority in your life. If anyone comes to Christ, they are a brand new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. To teach that some of the curses of sin and Satan and sickness continue into the born-again believer's life 
is an absolute doctrinal assault against the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is not tolerated in the Bible. What a lot of people miss on the subject of sickness, disease, healing, generational curses is they've not been taught doctrinally the difference between learned behaviors and generational curses. All curses are covered by the blood. Galatians 3 said that through Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed from the curse. No curse remains active in your life when you give your heart to Jesus Christ. No curse remains activated in your life when you become a child of God. When you repent of sin, receive Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. Not a repaired creature, a new creature. It's not like an automobile that was in a terrible accident and they take it to the body shop and they straighten out the frame and they put a new quarter panel on it and they take the dents and the dings out and they fill it with putty and they sand it and they prime it and they paint it and they return it to you and it looks new. But in the history of that car, it shows it was in a terrible accident. That's not salvation. Salvation is not God repairing you. Salvation is God renewing you. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away and all things, all things become new. Praise God. If you believe that and receive it where you're at, just say thank you Jesus out loud. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. No sin, no curse, no power of the enemy is able to wade through the blood of your conversion. Brand new in Christ. Then you have to learn how to operate in faith. Now the Bible says in Thessalonians that when a person gets saved, every believer has been given a new, listen, has been given not only a new life, but has been given a measure of faith. So the seedlings of faith are automatically activated in your life on the day of your salvation. But then there is a process of growing in your faith. That's why the Apostle Peter, in 2 Peter, Peter said this, You must grow in your faith. All right. With that laid down as a foundation, let's turn our attention specifically to divine healing. Why aren't all people healed? Why did so-and-so, who's a godly pastor, die prematurely? Why did so-and-so, who had such an incredible ministry, die prematurely in a plane crash? Why did my grandmother, who is the godliest woman I've ever met, why did she die of cancer? And the questions pile up, and people begin to struggle. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. There are a lot of denominations who do not teach divine healing from a biblical perspective. They teach divine healing based upon the injustice of the questions that I've just asked. And because they can't answer those questions that people have, there is a doctrine that exists that is called sovereignty of God. And basically, in a nutshell, what sovereignty doctrine teaches is that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and God is God, and sometimes God knows better than we do, and God uses sickness and disease and plague and infirmity and things of this nature. God uses that to make us stronger. And if we didn't go through sickness and disease, we wouldn't learn to trust in God. Or God put that sickness upon me because while I was in the hospital, I was able to lead the person in the bed next to me to the Lord. And if I hadn't had that disease, I'd have never been able to lead that person to the Lord. And all of this pile of non-biblical teaching begins to make sense to the natural mind. But the question is, is it what the Bible teaches? And the answer is, no, it is not what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm going to warn you up front. This is not an easy subject. This is a difficult subject. So, number one, and we're talking about divine healing. If I were in a seminary teaching on divine healing, I would begin with Divine Healing 101, and here's the first thing that I would teach you. 
I would teach you that everything that God does and everything that God requires and everything that God asks, He asks in the model of perfection. So what do you mean by that? Didn't He say in the Bible, I am perfect, so be thou perfect. He said that in the Bible. Well, do you know any perfect Christians? I don't. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. Romans 3 seemingly would say that can't be possible. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's a fact. In our life and in our past, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, God has established a new target. And that target is perfection. God wants you to live a sinless life. God gives you the power to live a sinless life. God gave you the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit so that you can live like Jesus instead of living like yourself. John chapter 3 and verse 30, He must increase, I must decrease. So the standard of God is always perfection. If you're taking notes, write that down. The standard of God is always perfection. And when He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ lived in sinless perfection. There was no sin in Him. Jesus lived in sinless perfection. The Bible tells us that. The Bible said that Jesus was tempted just as we are tempted in all ways, but did not sin. He was the sinless, pure Lamb of God who went to the cross representing that Lamb in the Old Testament, sinless, perfect, without flaw. And there upon the cross, the sinless Son of God died, and the Bible said through the shedding of His blood, He forgives our sins and He heals our bodies. So now that we understand this, and I want to just hang there just for a moment, Remember this, God always operates by the model of perfection. He said, be thou perfect, but we're not. He went on to say in another portion of Scripture, be thou holy, even as I, the Lord thy God, am holy. Well, who is as holy as God? I'm not, you're not, none of us are. But again, God sets the standard of perfection. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. Why would God create you in His image and then give you a model of a different image? Does that make sense? Why would God create you in an image but give you a model for living that is something else? He calls you to model His image because you were created in his image. In other words, you weren't created for sin. You weren't created for sickness and disease. You were not created for failure. You were not created for depression and discouragement. You were created in the image of God and the seeds of God's greatness lay inside of you even today. So when you understand that model, everything God does operates in the model of perfection. The standard of God is always perfection then bring divine healing, because that's what we're talking about today. There are many things in that model that we could teach on today. I'm only pulling one arrow out of the quiver, and we're talking about divine healing. So divine healing has to find its way into the model of perfection. So when I teach on healing, I want you to have a creative visual of a target. Now, if I were to take you out and teach you how to shoot bow and arrow, uh, I like to shoot bow and arrow. I have since I was a kid. I made uh, my first bow and arrow in the woods uh, out of sticks and, and uh, hunted with them. And I remember a birthday, uh, my mom asking me what I wanted, and I wanted a bow and arrow. And I would guess I would be maybe 10 uh, years old or so at the time. Uh, you won't even remember this. You'd have to be really old to remember S and H green stamps. And, uh, but with S&H green stamps, she got me a fiberglass 
bow, a recurved fiberglass bow with real arrows. And I practiced in the yard, and I got to the place where from across the yard, I could keep my arrows in a phone book, but not when I started. When I started, I wasn't used to the power of a recurved bow. And my first arrows went high and long, and I overcorrected and hit some short. But with practice and practice and more practice, I became qualified enough with that bow that I could keep my arrows in a phone book across the yard. And uh, I haven't shot my uh, compound bow here for a while, but uh, the last time that I did, I could keep my arrows in a pie plate at, at 40 yards. And, uh, but that takes practice, all right? What does that have to do with divine healing? In your mind, visualize a target. The center or the bullseye of that target is divine healing. Now, if I were to take you out and give you three arrows, give you some lessons, your first arrow goes high over the target, probably like my first shot did when I was a kid. And you totally missed it. And I said, you aimed a little high, aimed a little lower, and uh, you overcompensate with the next arrow, and it hits in the ground right in front of the target. And now you have one more arrow. You're a little frustrated. You thought, man, I should at least be able to hit the target. And then your last arrow hits the target, but just barely on the outside ring. And I were to ask you, what did you learn from shooting these three arrows? Would it be a logical response to say, I was unable to do well, I didn't hit the bullseye, therefore the target doesn't exist? Would that be a logical response? Of course it wouldn't. But that's what a lot of people do with divine healing. They see it in the Bible. They begin to learn a little bit about it. They perhaps sit under the teaching of a pastor or a denomination that believes in divine healing as opposed to those who teach against it. Because there are many denominations that said that was for the days of Christ, but it's not for today. But I can tell you that that's not proper teaching. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. Jesus said, the things that you've seen me do, these things shall you do, and greater things than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. He didn't put an expiration date on it. He did not put an expiration date on it. The power of salvation is available throughout the kingdom of God. And if salvation does not have an expiration date on it, because they are the same work upon the cross, divine healing does not have an expiration date on it either. The logical answer is not that the target doesn't exist because you couldn't hit it. The logical answer is you need more practice. And I don't want to oversimplify, but that's as clear as I can at least start you with healing at Healing 101. All right, let's review. The standard of God is always perfection. But none of us are perfect. But we must strive to meet the standards of God. Three things out of that I hope that you capture. Number one, the standard of God is always perfection. Be thou perfect. Be thou holy. So everything that God requires and asks, He always asks for the center of the bullseye. Number two, none of us are perfect. But it does not remove from us the obligation to strive for the bullseye. We must continually Act out John chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase, I must decrease. My carnal knowledge, my carnal application, my carnal experiences must become submissive to the requirements of God. And I must strive to be like Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. Jesus was the sinless, perfect model. And the Bible said, you must move towards that model. That's what sanctification is all about. That's what the doctrine of holiness is all about. That's what the doctrine of the flesh and the spirit are all about. We must be willing to say, my flesh is the enemy of God. So I move towards the standards of perfection. All right. With that in mind, people ask the question, well, if it's God's will for people to be healed, 
How come all people aren't healed? Don't take this as, as me being condescending. But the exact same logic that's in that question would be the exact same logic for people who would ask, how come people that walk all over the face of this earth have such terrible haircuts or don't cut their hair or look terrible or disheveled? How many of you know that a barber shop, or for the ladies that are watching, what do they call it, a salon, beauty salon? I got a thumbs up for my female producer. You have to go there and sit and avail yourself to the talents of the barber or the lady at the salon in order for you to have a proper haircut. Just because people are not healed, that's not a logical reason as to why, therefore, it not, must not be God's will for people to be healed. You've got to go to the healer and sit in the chair of divine healing and allow the divine healer to do his promised work. And many people have thrown out the subject of divine healing. All right, back to Healing 101. You're sitting in a seminary class. You're taking Healing 101, and very few seminaries teach on healing anymore. But here would be the second thing that I would teach you on divine healing, and that would be Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. In the New Living Translation, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Everything about Him, Jesus, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Very simple doctrinal truth. You could teach that in Sunday school class to the youngest of classes. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Why don't you just say that out loud? Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Now, why is Hebrews 1.3 so important? Because that's the bullseye. That's how you know where the bullseye is. That's what you're training for. That's why I gave you the illustration of the target and bow and arrow. Hebrews 1.3 is the bullseye. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Jesus is the bullseye. That's why I said John chapter 3 and verse 30, He, Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. That's the Bible verse that tells us we've got to get on the target. But once we're on the target, we can't settle for the last ring. We've got to keep increasing our faith towards the bullseye. What's the bullseye? Hebrews 1, 3, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So if Jesus represents the will of God exactly, let me ask you some simple questions. Was Jesus ever sick? Rồi, như vậy, hai điểm có cùng trạng thái chuyển động. Đó là điểm gì đây ạ? À? Điểm F và điểm N. Đúng chưa? Thầy có thể uh, mô tả tiếp theo. Đó là điểm F và N đang ở vị trí cân bằng đi lên bình dương. Bình dương, đúng không? Đây là hai điểm gần nhau nhất có cùng trạng thái chuyển động. Rồi tiếp tục, chúng ta coi cái điểm nào nữa đây. <cười> điểm quy này không được nha các bạn. Tại điểm quy này mặc dù nó ở vị trí cân bằng nhưng mà nó đang ở ở đi xuống bình âm nha. Đúng không ạ? Rồi, chúng ta có một cái hai điểm nữa là điểm G và điểm B. Chúng tiếp tục là điểm G và điểm B đang ở vị trí bình dương nhưng đi về vị trí cân bằng. Đang ở bình dương rồi đi về vị trí cân bằng. Đúng không ạ? Như vậy câu C các bạn trả lời ba ý, đây là ý thứ nhất. Đây là ý thứ hai, đây là ý thứ ba. Được chưa? Đó là nội dung câu số 2 của chúng ta. Tiếp tục chúng ta sẽ qua cái bài số 3. Xem nội dung cái bài số 3 xem coi nó như thế nào đây. Quan sát hình 1.2 so sánh biên độ và ly độ của hai dao động 1 và 2 tại mỗi thời điểm là bao nhiêu? Đây. Bài này chúng ta có hai cái dao động, dao động 1 
tương ứng với cái màu xanh dao động 2 thì tương ứng với cái màu đỏ và người ta nói so sánh biên độ và ly độ của hai dao động tại mỗi thời điểm khác nhau thì bây giờ các bạn coi nè pin